There's always been an innovation economy, and J.P. Morgan has an entire business dedicated to helping it thrive. By bringing together founders, startups, investors, and ideas, J.P. Morgan's Commercial Bank helps empower thousands of high-growth companies, companies that are shaping the present and the future. With tailored banking solutions on a global business network, J.P. Morgan helps innovators scale for today and tomorrow. Visit jpmorgan.com forward slash startups to find out how they can help you build your future. Products and services of J.P. Morgan Chase and & Company and its affiliates are subject to availability, eligibility, and applicable terms and policies. J.P. Morgan Chase Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Hey, everyone. Welcome to TechCrunch Live, where we help founders build better venture-backed businesses. I'm Matt Burns. And uh, founding a company is hard. It's hard enough, but founding a company in a non-existent market is even harder. I, I mean, nearly impossible. And I think this is a topic a lot of early stage founders will find interesting and helpful. You have a great idea, you have a decent path to market, and you have no competitors, and it sounds perfect. But then you try pitching the idea, and what happens? No one understands it, no one wants to buy it, and no one gives you money. It's a problem Sagi knows very well. He founded Benchling in 2012 after becoming... I mean, frustrated that there was not a cloud-based collaborative platform for data collection. He was at MIT and he was using pen and paper and spreadsheets to record data. The market was wide open for something like Benchlane, and I'll let him tell the story, but here's the spoiler. Benchlane has since raised $417 million and is worth, as of last year, over $6 billion. So let's just say he's been there and he's done that. And then joining him on today's event is Miles Grimshaw. He's the general partner at Benchmark and led Bench, Benchling seed round in Series A and is on the company's board of directors. So we have Benchmark and Benchling. This should be a great event. But first, uh, we need to talk about Minneapolis. On September 7th, I'm hosting a special TechCrunch Live with companies and investors from the Twin Cities. This is our third city spotlight of the year, and I'm excited. We started in Austin, then we went to Columbus, Ohio, and now on September 7th, we're doing a special event in Minneapolis. It's a fantastic startup ecosystem, and I've loved talking to people from there already in the run-up to this event. If you're a Minneapolis-based startup, please apply for the pitch off. For this event, we're doing more than pitch practice. We're actually giving you a prize. The winner of the Minneapolis City Spotlight Pitch Off will get free tickets and exhibition space for TechCrunch Disrupt and Fast Tracked into the Battlefield 200. There's a lot of terms, but it's a really great prize, and I hope you can participate. Just Google TechCrunch Live Minneapolis, and you'll find the form. Apply, please, by the end of the week. So with that said, oh, one more thing. If you're listening on, on Twitter Spaces, Thank you. Thank you so much. But there should be a link in there so you can join GRIP. And if you jump into the GRIP platform, you'll be able to watch today's show and see the Series B pitch, pitch deck that was brought along today. This is one of the pitch decks that led to Benchling's $6 billion valuation. So you, you might want to look at it. And I guess with that said, uh, it's time for Benchling and Benchmark. All right, Mayo, Saji, how are you? Great. Doing great. Thanks, Thanks for having us. us. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, it, it's a fascinating story. And Saji, we need to start with you. Before we look at your Series B pitch deck, I was hoping you could take us back to 2011, 2012, when you started this company. You're founding a company in a non-existent market. And I think you must have been told no by a lot of investors. What memory sticks out from fundraising for your seed round? Yeah, maybe stepping back, we'll give a little bit of context about how the, the company got, got started. Uh, so I'm Saji, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Benchling. Uh, our, our mission is to unlock the power of biotechnology. So the product we make, we call it the R&D cloud. Uh, so we make software that powers scientific discovery across the entire biotechnology industry. Think like medicines, food, crops, materials, diagnostics, and even, even some household goods. You can sort of think about our product as this central source of truth for scientific data, but it wasn't always that way. So kind of backing up to 2012, uh, I came from the world of software, actually. I'm a software engineer by training, studied computer science, but I got really interested in medicine and started working in a biology lab. And the thing that always stuck out to me was that uh, the difference in quality of tools available to scientists versus software engineers is really stark. You know, in the world of software, I had access to all these amazing tools for collaborating with other developers, whether it was GitHub or Jira and you name it. And every year those tools got faster, better, cheaper, and, and it made building software so, so much fun and, and so easy. You compare that to life as a scientist in the lab, and like I was, I was using like a paper notebook and spreadsheets and Microsoft SharePoint. It was really, really hard to collaborate with 
other people. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was really frustrating. I felt like a lot of my time was being wasted, even though the work was really important, led to the creation of Benchling. I wanted to build tools that could help scratch that itch and, uh, you know, be the kind of tools I wanted to use when I was in the lab. Obviously been quite a long time since then. We, we serve now more than a thousand customers around the world from small startups to fortune 500 organizations, companies like Regeneron mm -hmm. or Gilead names you may have heard of because of their COVID antibodies uh, or cutting edge startups like Verb Therapeutics who just dosed a patient with a one-time gene editing medicine to cure high cholesterol. So amazing things our customers are doing and we have an opportunity to participate in. Uh, and you know we're very lucky to work with 800 talented colleagues across the US and now in, in Europe as well. And some phenomenal investors, including Miles, who've had the pleasure of working with for I think seven years now from, from pre-revenue and five employees to well over nine figures today. Yeah. So take us back to that time and you're pitching your seed round and, and Miles yeah. can chime in here too, because he led that round, but what you're being told, no, probably a lot, right? What was the yeah. hardest part of that, that seed round? Yeah. I think zooming out, we, we always knew we were serving an important customer base and an important industry, you know, so many important global problems being solved by scientists leveraging biotechnology, whether it's disease or hunger or climate change. Uh, but you know, that's, you know, biotech wasn't as sexy at the time. This is way pre COVID. Uh, every software investor kind of thought what we were doing was small and unimportant. You know, they didn't understand biology. You know, at the time I feel like everything was about mobile or on demand. And e even SaaS wasn't that well understood in 2012. You had a handful of public SaaS companies at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we went to science investors and every science investor, they, they understood, you know, the challenges of R and D but they didn't understand software, you know, they invested in drugs. And so we were kind of in this weird tweener place where it was a struggle to raise money and we couldn't find sort of the investors with the right fit for us for quite some time. So how did you get yeah. Miles to write you a check? <laughs> well, I, uh, it started, started with a cold email. <laughs> uh, we, we met through a, a mutual friend who was actually investing in um, new drugs, the actual like science itself. And uh, he said to me, I've got this friend I know of, who's doing the software thing. I don't know software, you know software, you should go go meet him. And um, I met Saji and you were, I was kind of change aware at the time. I don't know about the science. I'm no bench scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but um, this was about 2014 and Feng Zhang and the Broad Institute where Saji had built some of the early um, software for those scientists had uh, just sort of come up with CRISPR and the ability to edit, edit genes. And so that was sort of in the zeitgeist a little bit in, in sort of like, you know, maybe the odd, uh, you know, MIT review article was talking mm -hmm. about gene editing and what it would unlock. And so you knew some, uh, the change was happening. And when, you, when I met Saji and Ashu, you had two co-founders who um, knew the bench science, had, had, had worked in those labs, had been doing the research, but were also amazing engineers and could build great product and distill it into an easy user experience. That's just a really hard combination, a rare combination to come together. And so it was a very authentic mission with lots of like hard earned, hard won insights from firsthand experience. And so that was sort of a powerful um, set of ingredients to, to, to get to go and shape an industry. Obviously, it wasn't per se going to be a big industry. It was still nascent. But mm -hmm. I think the, the question um, is less how big is the market today so much as what could it be and what's the rate of growth of that market? And a small market growing quickly is actually really powerful for a new company to be able to actually have outsized market share. An early stage team, five people building, building the first pieces of software, you can't actually capture the whole market at once, even if it was or it already existed and was really large. You just can't, you can't eat it all off. You can't bite it all off. And so the 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 lens of what's the rate of growth and and how much of the incremental evolution each year can we actually capture is a powerful thing. And and some of the biggest companies in the world are really that way, you know, even Amazon entering e-commerce. E-commerce was was pretty small that then. They sure. started in books, but they they took a large share of the incremental purchasing each year. They did cloud. Cloud, when they started, was pretty small. It was all on-prem. Large share of the incrementally share. Even Shopify, kind of down market, you'd have said, eh, niche, small, SMBs. But that was growing really rapidly as a function of distribution. Large share of it as it developed. And so the opportunity to... Um, take advantage of the scientific revolution was that was happening in bio 
with an amazing software team and and and, and serve those sure, uh, sure. that emergent market market was uh, a really rare opportunity to get to to commit to and and help shape. Yeah, so we, you have the benefit of of retrospect here now, right? So you, you're ten years into this company. Who was your first target market, and how has that changed? Yeah, when we when we first started benching, we actually gave the software away completely for free to academics. That's where that's where we came from. It's where we knew there were end users with a problem who could take advantage of the software. Uh, a lot of people thought we were pretty crazy for doing that, you know, giving software for free to academics who have no money. There's not like a, you know, freemium funnel there where they're going to all of a sudden start converting and then paying you money. Uh, but we knew we were serving a really important customer base, which was those end users, those scientists. Um, and so uh, I think that was something actually Miles did a really good job of encouraging us to stay focused on early on. We didn't make the switch to generating revenue or selling an industry for quite some time, but we kept that, we kept the team lean and kept very focused on those academic users for actually a couple of years. When, when, Saji says they were. Some people thought they were crazy. Uh, uh, some people thought it was even futile. There was uh, there were some investors uh, who even said uh, you should open source it and go do something else. Um, but it's a powerful foundation to have. Well, who, said, who said that, Miles? There, there, there was there was there was uh, some some top five venture capitalists who who thought it was best as an open source uh, non commercial project at the time, um, and. Uh, but it's it, it's a sort of slower ramp, but a, a strong foundation, and and you can look to examples of um, iconic software companies um, like like Adobe, obviously with Photoshop that has it in an academic setting, um, or uh, or um, GitHub has done it for for engineers. Um, Autodesk. Autodesk is a, a another great example where there was a blue ocean of research labs pioneering this science who didn't have who didn't have great so software, and you create a moat there of adoption and and of training that mm -hmm. like money money can't really attack. If we give something away for free, how do you how do you come and take those users from us? You can't disrupt us, um, and and that user base who's all trained in benchling is is the start of to all of the commercial professional users. Um, and so I think Saji, you probably have some good anecdotes of teams that that used us for free in academia, um, spun out, started building a commercial company, uh, and they started buying us. And then they even went in and got bought by a bigger company because these R and D teams got bought. And now we're in the uh, uh, you know a Fortune 50 organization. Before we yes. talk about that, let's bring up the Series B pitch deck. I think the first slide we're going to look at will will help illustrate this point as well. Yeah, it was a it was a long long journey from the company being started, the first lines of code being written, the product being in the hands of end users, and you know a couple of years of iterating with academics and really building a product we knew could win the hearts and minds of scientists. And as Miles mm -hmm. said. Some of those scientists ended up spinning out, starting new companies, uh, or or joining existing companies and bringing Benchling with them. And it was because of their love for the product as an end user that gave us the kind of shot on goal. And we actually learned the kind of problems that those businesses were facing and led to the expansion of the platform. You know, platforms can take a long time to build. Uh, and from there, we saw a lot. We, that's when we began to see commercial success. Sure. And, and what changed about the company's focus over time? Yeah, over time we had to, as we were supporting larger and larger teams using Benchling, we definitely had to evolve as a company, you know, to build a worldwide go-to-market team, a sales force, uh, professional services to support our customers. You know, you you go from a, a product that end users adopt on their own to a product for large organizations because of the amount of change it's uh, causing for them and the value it's creating. They expect a lot of uh, handholding and and kind of tailored support. Now this. This pitch deck is very polished and very beautiful. Did do you happen to know? Do you remember if you hired a firm to make this thing for you? Oh no, we. I think we were <laughs> we were very lean at the time. Uh, I I worked on it quite a bit myself, uh, uh, with obviously some support from Miles and our existing investors. Yeah, Miles, you're laughing at that, right? How many how many of your your other investments hire firms for these things? I I have never worked with a team that has really? hired, hired an, like maybe a little bit of design support. Um, but I, making a, a, the deck um, actually had and taking the time to do it has enormous benefit for fundraising. But it's actually your training telling a story. Your training telling the story of the the business and the opportunity, and and that training um, you use for 
executive recruiting, you use in a different, slightly different twist when you're selling customers, you use for a slightly different twist, but the same foundation when you're doing press. And so investing the reps um, and the hard work of sort of synthesizing and distilling to the essence um, is a really worthy investment. And so that, like definitely not something that gets outsourced um, and so we might have drawn it on paper napkins or, 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 or bad sketch figures in PowerPoint or whatever, uh, and, and they got cleaned up. But uh, no, Saji and I and, and all the teams I work with, that's a, that's a big area of um, focus and thoughtful time. Man, I, lo- I love that passion. That, that's a great answer. So let's take a look at this timeline here. If you this ended in 17, if this was to extend out even farther, what would it say? Uh, it would show us, it would show us launching a, a lot of new products and show us also really making a ton of commercial traction. You know, we've gone from at the time this deck was created, we were subscale revenue, probably just a couple million, million dollars of recurring revenue, handful of customers to today more than a thousand globally. Yeah. And, and the miles, when you look at decks like this, right, you see this timeline. How does this help you as an investor? Yeah, I think um it 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 sets the stage for the for the journey that the founders been on, and you can start to talk about the sequencing and why they've made the choices that they've made and why they picked the product um, sequencing and decisions along the way, um, why they serve certain markets at different point, you know, and and how that will evolve and grow. And you might look at this obviously and say, well, the company was founded in 2012. We're literally a decade later, so you know the. That it takes a decade is is really true, and we're not even we're not even done. Uh, talk about grit and tenacity uh, from Saji and Ashu and the team. Um, but the the thing that uh, I think uh, quite a bit about um, is that, especially in the sort of time we've been in, is that pacing out of the gates is is far less important than pacing at scale. And some companies do grow slower uh, and take more time, have to build more um, early on. And the the speed at which that happens, sometimes that the market pulling you instantly, you know, is an indication of uh, of that fit. But sometimes it takes a little while. You have to build more. And so I personally, if you looked at this and said, "Wow, six years," and they only had a couple million of revenue, that that doesn't um, uh, 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 make me shy away. Um, insofar as I'm I'm much more wondering what could be the pacing and scale. how fast could we be growing when, when we're a hundred million of revenue, 200 million of revenue. And so the time duration here um, is, is sort of fine and more testament to the hard work it takes to build a product that really serves this market in, the, in a special way, which becomes a moat. You know, the, I, I hear pacing a lot from a lot of entrepreneurs. What's the best way to express to an investor that this thing is going to take some time, that it's not an overnight success? I think that um, uh, founders' knowledge of the market and ability to articulate that in terms of product sequencing, um, user segment sequencing, et cetera, um, you you can't do it maybe on a Zoom meeting in 15 minutes if you're trying to make a decision that day, but you can do it over a, over a lunch, over a coffee um, or the like. And you know, it's, I think the, the a slide like this um, set up to facilitate a conversation of let's walk you through the decisions we've made. We could have, it would be, it would have been very easy as I partnered in 24, 15, 14, 15 on this slide, <laughs> 14. right? I, 14, they hadn't launched the lab notebook yet. It was just the single player tool. There was only one piece of the product platform. And, uh, and after that, we built these next three things even, and there's a lot more since, um, but it was just a single player tool. And Saji and I, spent some time. We, we got to the whiteboard and we said, well, well, what would be next? Why would you prioritize that? We could have said, let's go take this and get as much revenue from the single player tool as we can from enterprise. There were customers that were they're using us there. We could have said, let's run as fast as possible to get to a few million of ARR and then raise a big round. But that wasn't, that wasn't the mission. That wasn't actually going to set us up stronger for later, setting us up in a more powerful way. Again, what's the pace at scale was let's go win the hearts and minds of academics. Let's go build a really easy to use product that for a user base that has to Mm self-serve. We're not onboarding them with professional services. They have to figure it out. They have to want it. Let's go win the hearts and minds that feeds into the commercial 
market because they you have to learn it in academia before you can do it professionally and as we do that let's build a product suite that can really be that central r d team product um, and let's come to market with that and so we knew it was going to take a, a a few years but we didn't build in build in the dark um, and sort of an ivory tower uh, before we before we kind of um, met the market yeah let's take yeah. a look at the the next slide here this is one of my favorite ones, right? This is at 2017 when this deck was was published or for public rather for you guys. Um, it, your, your, your market was emerging, right? This was, it was already established. There's other players. So take us through this slide. Yeah, the I think given that we're a vertical company, meaning we serve biotechnology, it's really important to educate software investors on, on what that means. When we first started the company, it's, as you said, biotechnology was, it existed, but it was, you know, a lot of the innovation that's happened in the last decade was was net new. We got, as Miles mentioned earlier, CRISPR gene editing was just just coming out in 2012 mm -hmm. out of academic labs. The first cell and gene therapies, you know, breaking classes of medicines hadn't been approved yet. There were no mRNA vaccines back then, and so it, uh, RNA was relatively new technology. So it had all this incredible scientific innovation happening that was leading to these amazing applications. And so kind of biology itself was just coming on board at the time. So I really wanted to paint a picture to investors that this is a really important trend. Do you want to bet on biotechnology continue to eat more and more of GDP to you know transform more and more of the economy? And like that's an easy bet to make long term. I think it's really stood the test of time and I'd still go long on it today, obviously. Right. Yeah. So at the Go ahead, Miles. I was I was going to say the uh, the thing that's hard to decipher in this slide is I I, I barely know half of the science behind uh, behind some of the stuff on the left. Of course, but as, but as an investor, um, you think about what are the what are the customers that the company is orienting its product development towards, right? The customers become your feedback cycle of product development, and. Um, Saji could speak to it more, but some of those logos on the right were some of the companies that were really pioneering this new market. And so you might equate it to um, Stripe early on, you know, winning Lyft or winning Shopify. You know, you were winning this new mobile um, digital native economy. And these logos, well, while, while they just look like logos and the revenue to anyone else, the revenue, the texture of that revenue, the texture of those logos. Mm were the market leaders who were going to who, who demanded excellence of our product, who pulled out new development from us, who pulled out new features from us. So Sajia, I'm sure can add add color to that, but um, that's something that I was thinking about at the time. Saji? Yeah, I think if you if you if you're one of those innovators and you're going to choose a you know software product to run your R and D on, and keep in mind these are R and D companies. That's that's their business. Like when when they start off, they don't have a drug or other product on the market. So they have to, they have to build one. And so the problem they were facing had to have been so complex and challenging for them to go to a small software startup in, you know, in the Bay area, most of these companies are actually on the East coast in, in Boston, which is sure. on the biotech capital of the U S. And so the problem they were facing had to have been critical mission critical to them, that they were willing to go out of the box and, and partner with a company like us. And at the time were any of these partners? Uh, were any of these customers at the time? Some of those were actually customers. our customers. Yeah. Um, How about and, now? But this is many of the uh, even more our customers. Now we have a pretty strong uh, retention rate because the the software is mission critical to what our customers do. Uh, right. Okay. Great. Let's look at the last slide that you brought along with you. Yeah. So this is actually, I, I think, obviously, in our pitch deck, we covered our our revenue and some detailed deep dives on our enterprise customers, how they're using benchling, but it's been really important to us to never lose sight of the academics. We talked about them extensively earlier. Benchling is still free for them today. It's a self-serve product. Every day there are tens of thousands of undergrads, grad students, PhD students, postdocs all over the world who log into Benchling and, and use it for their work. And to Miles's point earlier, you know, given our mission is to unlock the power of biotechnology, it's really important that we as a company keep our eye on that as well and train the next generation of scientists to use Benchling. And so it's something we've just continued to do year after year since the beginning. And some, something you guys said earlier is, is you didn't want to build in the dark. How does this slide illustrate that fact? Yeah, I, even when we were five people, every single person at the company wrote code and they talked to customers. Uh, even though my co-founder and I, Asha and I, came from a scientific lab, we've always recognized that we're not there anymore. And science is changing and evolving so quickly. So we're not users of our own product. So it's really important that we listen very carefully to our customers. And because we're in a vertical, 
Uh, one thing that's been very powerful is that the customers are actually very clear with us what their problems are. Uh, everyone does different research. You know, we work with everything from folks curing cancer to folks growing meatless meat in a lab. Uh, but the underlying scientific technology is actually pretty similar. So if you're doing a good job of listening, the customers are going to articulate the problems for you. It's up to you to come up with a generalized solution for it. Do you remember the first people you talked to? Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, one of our uh, funny story, like one of our first 10 users was my co-founder's brother-in-law who was doing a PhD. So that we had that. And another one of our first 10 users actually now works at Benchling probably eight years later after the fact. So I remember some of the names of all these people and the first yeah. customers. I mean, you were at MIT at the time. So, so there's plenty of, plenty of peers around you that you could have talked to. Did you go outside of MIT before you launched the first version? Uh, the first, yeah, the first users of the product were folks we knew from, from school at MIT, but also we were out in the Bay area at the time as well. And so in the early days, we would drive over to Cal or Stanford and kind of go from lab to lab or get introductions from people we knew. And we would sit down one by one with scientists and understand why or they were or weren't using the product. Yeah. And, and you said you still do that today. So I'm hoping you can give some advice to entrepreneurs that are just starting their first project and running up to an MVP. How should they approach these people? Yeah, I, I think it's really easy to build when there's a certain amount of founder market fit. So one thing that worked really well for Ashu, my co-founder and I, is that we, we sort of built the first version for ourselves. What would we have liked to use when we were in lab? And then we were able to take that and go to the folks we knew who worked in labs, kind of used our network. And it's okay to do things that are really unscalable at the start. We were concerned about our first 10 users. How do we make them really, really successful? If we got 10, like, can we get 50? Can we get 100? Uh, and we kind of incrementally built from there. Took a lot of patience, of course. Yeah, and, and Miles, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs on gathering feedback? Yeah, there's a, there's a there's a lot of it that is um, pure elbow grease, as yeah, as right. elucidates there. Um, I think that as you move beyond um, having any corpus of, of of users to listen to, um, the interesting consideration is: Are you listening to the vanguard of the market? And mm. What was powerful, we talked about earlier, right? Many of those logos were on the bleeding edge of, of their research. Um, the, they were at the forefront of where the rest of the market and, and other users were going to, going to try and catch up to. They were, the, they were going to be their customers um, and, and, and pioneering in a way that the rest of the market would idolize and say, how do, how do I get my team to, to do the research they're doing to, 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 to be able to keep up? And so you've got to have someone to listen to. But once you've sort of crossed some of that threshold, I think thinking about who, um, who are the leaders in the market, who are the power users that will pull greatness out of the product, will pull the future, will pull you into the future, pull the product into the future, actually is a really powerful moat for the long run. Because if you have the pioneering customers who are demanding the most and you're listening to them and, 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 and continuing to serve them, just theoretically imagine any incremental competitor emerges, you've got the best feedback source on lock and you've got to keep up, you've got to keep building, you've got to stay, stay aggressive. Um, but, but it's, it's a very powerful foundation. And so I think, um, Saji did that, Saji and the team did that really well, um, early on, uh, with, with a lot of elbow grease that continues. Yeah. So when, when, a, when a investor or an, I'm sorry, when a founder pitches you, do you like to hear who they've talked to already? Absolutely. That that adds that adds really important qualitative color. Um, you know, I, I think a lot a million dollars of ARR can mean very different things. It can have very different texture to it, and so or five million of ARR, or any number. And so I think a lot about what's the texture um, of that underneath it. Uh, that that's great advice. Now, Sanji, back to you. Really, the last couple of questions go to you. You you guys have raised four hundred and seventeen million. You're worth over six billion, but you raised last October. When's your next fundraising? Uh, we don't have any plans for future financings right now. Uh, I think we're we have a very healthy balance sheet from our last couple of financings, and uh, we have a you know great business with a lot of a lot of customers, and that generates revenue. And so we're pretty focused on on continuing I, to I know, our I know. Oh, you don't like to talk about it, but I have to ask. So if you're not fundraising, are you looking at the public markets? Eventually, yeah. That, that's the path for you guys, huh? We want to build a, a long-term business that'll help serve our customers and advance our mission. And so at the right time, sure. 
What, what do you see as the end point for your company? How big do you think this thing's going to grow? Uh, I think the sort of for us, like we're, we're tethered to biotechnology. And so if I look at medicines, food, agriculture, consumer product goods, diagnostics, uh, biotechnology is going to solve some of the world's most pressing problems over the coming decades. Uh, I think it's a, it is a multi-decade company that we think we're building. And so I hope that we're, we're continuing to build and, and deliver value to our customers for, for many years to come. That's a great answer. Well, I, I think we're going to leave it there. And that kind of concludes the first part of TechCrunch Live. Um, I, I appreciate both of you, but you're both sticking around to help with pitch practice. And uh, pitch practice right. is one of my favorite things that we do. We bring on three entrepreneurs who applied earlier today. They were just notified. We bring them on. They give you two minutes to pitch all three of us and then the audience. And then they get four minutes of feedback from the two of you and maybe sometimes a little bit from me too. So with that said, it's time to bring on the first person. The first person we have is Ronnie. And Ronnie's coming from Dyad Medical. Did I say that right, Ronnie? Are you are you here? I'm going to click through the Zoom. I should have done that already. I see you. If you can turn on your microphone and your camera. Maybe. There you yes. are, Ronnie. Yeah. yeah. How are you? Very good. Thank you. So well, thanks it's, for being it's with Tony, us. Tony, just like Tony, by the way. With the okay. Great. Well, fantastic. Well, you, you have two minutes to present your company starting now. Thank you. So my, my name is uh, Rani Shalev, and uh, I'm the co-founder of Diet Medical, a Boston-based uh, startup company. We are building a software platform capable of analyzing medical images automatically, focusing on the heart images. Adoption rate of medical imaging technology is accelerated in recent years, uh, in, in enormous amount of image data is being generated. However, the subsequent demand of medical image interpretation skills emerges as a challenge causing an enormous increase in workload for clinicians, leading to dangerous backlog and burnout of practitioners. This time pressure can no longer be compensated for by minor improvements in the current standard of manual tracing and analysis. So this is why the Timidad Medical uh, created the Libby platform. It performs automated image interpretation, supporting the four main modalities used in cardiac imaging, providing a single interface to all of them. It is integrated into the physician's workflow, analyzing each incoming scan without human intervention, highlighting the most urgent cases. We have four patents pending. We have two of our applications that have been cleared by the FDA for clinical use. We signed various levels of agreements of collaboration with various big, large uh, healthcare uh, systems. We have paying customers and a few additional ones in the pipeline who are in discussions with machine and software vendors to use our software. We will play a dominant role in a large market estimated to be $7 billion in the US, where in Asia it's roughly eight times that. DB is cost effective for the hospital and about 90% margin uh, business for us. Uh, we were awarded $2.6 million and closed the pre seed round of about $1.7 million as a convertible note. And right now we're seeking $4.5 million intended to build uh, a sales team and all the supporting resources. Thank you for listening. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Your, your framing is a little off there. You're a floating head. If you can pull your laptop down. That would be great. Anyway, uh, so let's let's start with you, Miles. Any feedback? Ronnie, um, great, to, great to meet. Um, and, and an exciting area for sure. I think um, if you think about broad, broadly speaking, um, uh, you didn't mention AI, I don't think in there, but sort of, I guess actually, sorry, well, I guess that's in, in a big part of it, but like AI applied to medical imaging data, how, how can we derive better insights from um, the huge volume of data capture that it is happening, leading to a better standard of care is certainly a, a, a fantastic um, vision that we should all be excited for. And it's going to take a lot of uh, hard work to get there. So I think that's uh that's exciting. It sounds like you've got some customers already, which is awesome to be in the field. I think um, one of the challenges in it all is sort of fitting, thinking about what all the constituents that are around you, which I'm sure you're 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 dealing with, which is as the HR data and the HR vendors, and they control a lot of this. You've got to change, you know, individual flows, organizational flows. I'm sure there's some reimbursement questions and who's paying and how to manage. So there's a lot of complexity uh, around you. And I would say, as you think about building here, um, how to, again, a bit to, to what we were talking about earlier, there's a way to chase revenue faster 
but sort of have it be more weakly integrated, more more weakly in the system. And I think I'd spend the time because again, it's a very focused market to 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 really understand and explore um, what are the incentives of the different players and and how to really um, serve them in a way that then is repeatably um, scalable. Um, I think as you as you share with other investors. I would certainly in follow-ups be thinking about which uh, you can't bite off all of this at once and different, different hospitals, different care organizations um, have very different demands, very different needs, very different incentives. And so what are, what is kind of the unfurling of the onion, so to speak, the concentric circles of the market that you might serve. And, and there's probably, I'd imagine a bit of a cool walk run uh, evolution to that. Um, to 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 share and and as you think about raising money and investing to attack it, having the having an investor have confidence and 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 be on the same page with you as to the sequencing of that investment and and how you'll step into proving that um, proving that out. That's great, Sagji. Any feedback on this pitch? Sure. First, congrats on all your success, Ronnie. Sounds like you you've got the inklings of a successful company. Um, I'd just say, like, first thing, you're working in an industry that's probably a bit slower to adopt technology. So slower burn means, like, my recommendation is just make sure that you can go get 10 super happy, referenceable customers um, who are, you know, living and breathing your software and couldn't do their jobs without it. I think if you can get those 10, like, you're, you're off to the races, and it sounds like you have a, you have a couple already. My second piece of advice would probably be to be really conscious of some of the larger customers earlier on those kind of companies can the they can really pull the center of gravity uh towards them and it can make it tricky to make sure that you're building something that's generalizable and you can take the industry the rest of the industry um so oftentimes it is better to like have a set of smaller customers and have a logical progression to kind of work your way up to the the large enterprises over time it's kind of reminiscent and, and- of how we if I, if I can interrupt, I think one one key word there that I don't want to get lost was referenceable, right? You want the customers that you have to be able to provide references. Yeah, absolutely. You want, when Miles was looking at investing in Benchling, he he called tons of customers. And I think that's a common thing you'll see if you want customers who are so excited about the software, they're invested in your your future and, and roadmap. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you for that that feedback. And Ronnie, thank you so much for, uh, for applying and pitching. Make sure you do it again. We'll have you back on a different show. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye now. Thanks, okay. Great. Now, next one, uh, we have Kristen, it looks like. Kristen from Locket. Locket Insure. Are you there? There you are. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi there. Can well, you hear me? Yep, we can hear you just fine. You have two minutes to present your company it's starting now. Cool. Well, I'm going to be talking about something very boring insurance. Uh, are you still there? I hope you haven't lost you yet. Um, why am I talking about insurance? Because it is the single biggest industry in the world. There are more insurance policies than people, but seven in 10 of us feel that their insurer is actively trying to cheat them. There are many problems with insurance, but the biggest one for me personally is the big fat lie that most of them use, which is we protect you. The truth is insurance is not an umbrella. It's a towel. What if we could change that? Uh, Well, you know my name already, but I'm going to introduce myself. Anyway, I'm Christian, the founder and CEO of Locket. Prevention first insurance for digital natives. We're using connected devices and behavior changing, gamified education to help our members to prevent bad things from happening in the first place. With this new approach, we will benefit from a lower loss ratio and a much higher customer lifetime value. Our beachhead is home insurance, but ultimately we want to become the only insurance app you need on your phone. We have four revenue streams, our own insurance, third-party insurance add-ons, in-app marketplace, and professional services such as preventative home, home health checks. Since launching in November, we've written over 1.3 million in annualized premium. We've onboarded over 4,500 paying customers. We built partnerships with uh, up to 30 industry partners such as Ring and Philips Hue. Uh, this isn't my first insure tech. In 2016, I co-founded a startup in the space called Neos, which was acquired two years later by Aviva, which is the UK's largest insurance company. We're now raising $5 million to build three fundamental USPs that will position us very well for Series A next year. These USPs are differentiated distribution, a very powerful middleware, and new sources of data that will help us build novel underwriting models. 
happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Oh, that was very good. You ended Five on time. The line. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great work. And and the pitch came off nice and clean. I like the joke at the beginning. Miles, we'll start with you again. Any feedback on the pitch? Um, obviously, insurance is a is, is, is a big market, so so you're tackling that. I think there's, um, I'd say over the last five years, seven years or so, I'm sure it was before that too, have heard uh, different teams pitch better data will lead to better underwriting, will lead to cheaper insurance um, uh, as a macro theme. Um, you, you certainly saw it in auto as an interesting case, which conceptually made some sense, um, hasn't played out to, to my knowledge. Um, and so I, 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 I didn't actually get from, I don't think I got from the pitch uh, what the insurance product was per se going to be. I said, I know partnerships with rings, so maybe it's something about your home um, and security of your home potentially. Um, and, but I think this is, a, this is an industry of, and an idea where you'll want to give uh, investors and, and should expect from them, I think even early on, um, a fair amount of scrutiny as to what is the offering and why is data um, really going to change the fundamental premise that you, you then still have a distribution question because insurance isn't something people tend to seek out quite as much and they're very price sensitive, et cetera, et cetera. But I think um, uh, you, giving confidence in the same way that if you were doing a, uh, at the first versions of it maybe didn't have to do this, but if you were doing an on-demand 15 minute delivery company, like you've got to have a real argument for why the unit economics can, can, can shift here and be interesting. I think you'll want to do a lot of scrutiny um, and be able to give a lot of confidence how data really um, ultimately really does impact risk um, and scoring. And so um, I would cool. definitely take the time to investigate that. So I, I think to sum up your, your, your thoughts here is be more specific in an established market when you're pitching. Matt, you should synthesize everything I say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here yeah, for I'll you. More clearly, I guess, because the, 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 I'm sorry. I, I, I probably shouldn't be commenting now, but the, the, the USB okay. actually, that we are using smart devices, connected devices to actually stop those bad things from happening uh, rather than data. Data is a side a kind of side effect of that and longer mm -hmm. term is to help us create new products, but the, the, we are using- What are the bad things out of curiosity? The biggest one is water leaks. Uh, water yeah, damage yeah, okay. causes more damage than fires and thefts combined. And we now have smart stopcocks, kind of smart shutter valves that you can control from your app and automatically shut off water when there's a leak. Uh, you've got video doorbells that truly deter intruders. We've got studies and you know our own insider uh, kind of uh, knowledge that we can uh, deter intruders and break-ins. So I, that, that's the big one. Yeah, I had a water leak last year from a bidet. Can you fix that? Because that was bad. Not, not retrospectively, but you know. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, okay. any feedback? Yeah, yeah. That's going to stop it happening again. Yeah, kids. That's how you. That's how you stop getting them out of the house. Sagi, over to you. Yeah. Look, I, I don't know the first thing about insurance or, or Web three, but I would say when I when I think insurance, I think you're obviously doing something with data that you believe fundamentally hasn't been done before, and so and you're you're parlaying that into underwriting some kind of product, and so stressing the quality and you know technical prowess of your team. That's going to be doing that, especially on the risk side, seems like a, one of the first places I think investors are gonna, gonna go. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Absolutely. Well, well, Kristen, thank yeah. you so much for pitching your company. Best of thank luck you to your locket and- Thanks for the feedback. Cheers guys. Absolutely. All right, last one. We only have time for one more. And I, I know there's a couple other companies in the wings waiting. We'll have you on first time next, next week. So, but the last one for today is Eva with Marble Labs. URL is marblelabs.io. Eva, are you there? I see you. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. You have two minutes to present your company starting now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eva Sade, and I am the co-founder of Marble Labs. At Marble Labs, we are defining the sector of augmented telehealth because we believe that physicians, if you add in devices and algorithms, can make better decisions for their patients and we can get a deeper level of care. The problem today is that telehealth is very limited in scope. If you need an annual physical, you need your eyes checked, your ears checked, that various infections, you actually need to go get hands-on care. And so 9% is the only penetration rate for employer-based health programs that are only dealing with telehealth. So where we see this going is a much more connected experience. 
What we're seeing is that RPM, remote patient monitoring, is the first foray into trying to do that, being able to, at your home, have various devices, but they're pretty limited and they're disposable. What has happened is that the FDA has approved over 1,200 different connected devices that enable people to head to toe, if you had them, actually get a full executive physical, whether they're a factory worker to a CEO. And the FDA has approved various self-test kits that can actually get into your body and your blood. So all this stuff are stub solutions. What we're doing is creating a platform, an open platform to put it all together from the devices to the algorithms people like Roni are making um, to, to the various traditional data sources. We're putting those together. We've got off the shelf devices and an app where someone is um, using all of those to actually have that experience and own their health record, whether they're in our system or out our system, we integrate with the major EHRs. Our target market is employer wellness solidly. I've sold 17 million in contracts at previous startups um, to the employer health market. We're also seeing that dental offices are obsessed with this because it seems to look like the next Menic Clinic of the future. We're raising 3 million. Thank you. Uh, way to cut that right at the end. That, that was well done. Well rehearsed. Okay. And you said head to toe. That reminded me. We had a smart sock startup a few years ago at, at a disrupt competition. It was great. Anyway, let's, let's start with Sanjay. Or... Yeah. Uh, I think when I think of programs that are sold to uh, HR depart departments, primarily as a kind of employer benefit, uh, one of the places they struggle the most is with low utilization, you know, getting from that HR department, single buyer, and, and speaking as, you know, a CEO of a company where I'm, I approve these purchases and going from there to actual adoption by the employee base and presumably how you get, get paid, I think is where it seems like most companies in the space tend to struggle or fall down. I think utilization ends up being on, on the lower side. Um, so like, I think my, my general encouragement is to like really, really spend time on the incentives uh, for employees to adopt the technology and the user experience for them. And I don't know if there's a way to even kind of cut the middleman out and go spend time directly with that cohort of people before you really scale up the employer sales. Because the pattern I see with a lot of the other companies kind of working in space is they have great distribution selling in HR departments and they get a lot of scale, but then kind of they don't, they don't get the utilization they expect and it makes uh, monetization a challenge. Yeah, that's great feedback. Okay, Miles? Um, I think the uh, you're obviously it's a it's an important area and one that there's a lot of change and you even um, talked about some of the change that's happening very viscerally recently in terms of regulatory approvals and change that that's going on there. Um, I think it's a uh, it's a tough market healthcare in general to get into, and who who's the motivated user who's the person who's recommending or they're self-opting into it what are the economic incentives tied to it and so i think that um uh, companies in this space generate g benefit a bit from sort of a bit of a barbell approach to their pitching which is you sort of can get the buy-in for conceptually where to go approach where to go tackle and the opportunity but then getting very specific as well about who, why, what the incentives are, um, uh, what the packaging up of the, what the you know initial MVP is going to be, etc., will be um, really important because it's not it's not a it is a market in change, but it's not a market that tends to lightly adopt um, or just test things out as easily. And so I think giving investors confidence um, and, and over time and detail sort of sharing. The, the real package and strategy uh, of go to market and product um, is uh, it will be really important. Yeah, that, that's helpful because I notice it in the pitch, one major section I forgot is traction and progress. And like, do you have pilots? Do you have LOIs? So I glossed over that section. I could give some information about it, but this is mostly feedback time. Yeah. Well, you, you have one minute left. So go ahead. Okay, yeah, so we we built this, we got all the requirements gathering and did the research sessions with um, Deloitte, Caterpillar, and Pitney Bowes to directly solve what problems they're trying to, um, trying to tackle. And one of the important things for industrial employers, they have OSHA requirements, so they, their people will literally have to use it. Um, which is great for adoption. You have to have to use it. Uh, so the the target market's really industrial employers um, because of those requirements. I'll, I'll tell you that. 
that last section there was off the cuff and it was fantastic. It showed your knowledge in, in the industry and it, it was clearly passionate. Okay. So that, that type of tone is great. Yeah. Sometimes you can over rehearse a pitch and then I hear so many of these things. I'm sure Miles does too. And you know, when the person is just reciting the line and, and, and that's fine, but if you can talk from the heart, it's even better. Sounds good. Congrats. All right. Congrats very, for very up concrete great and customers tactical. Like that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. All right. Well, well, thank you everyone for being involved today. And if you want to participate in pitch practice, just Google TechCrunch pitch practice and you'll, you'll find the form right there. We really should have a better way of sending that, but I don't. So that's what you have to do. Um, please, please join us next week. It's going to be a fantastic show. And, and to Miles and Sagji, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Matt. There's always been an innovation economy and JP Morgan has an entire business dedicated to helping it thrive. By bringing together founders, startups, investors, and ideas, J.P. Morgan's Commercial Bank helps empower thousands of high-growth companies, companies that are shaping the present and the future. With tailored banking solutions and a global business network, J.P. Morgan helps innovators scale for today and tomorrow. Visit jpmorgan.com forward slash startups to find out how they can help you build your future. Products and services of J.P. Morgan Chase & Company and its affiliates are subject to availability, eligibility, and applicable terms and policies. J.P. Morgan Chase Bank N.A. Member FDIC.